Hello and welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Today, we are very happy to have amongst us Dr. Mo Banerjee from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will be speaking on the disinherited Christianity and conversion in Calcutta. Dr. Mo Banerjee is an assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She holds an MA and PhD in history from Harvard University and is a historian of modern South Asia, specializing in the period from the 18th to 20th centuries. Her research interests include religion and politics in India, especially on the evolution of the concepts of private faith and public political identity during the 19th and the 20th centuries. We are also very happy to have amongst us Dr. Devjani Bhattacharya as a chair for this event. Dr. Bhattacharya is an associate professor of history at Drexel University in Philadelphia. She's also the author of Empire and Ecology in the Bengal Delta, The Making of Calcutta, which was published in 2018 from Cambridge University Press. She's currently working on her second book manuscript, tentatively titled Monsoon Landscapes, Law and Climate Science in the Indian Ocean world, which explores how the East India Company's marine insurance cases shaped the 18th and 19th century climate science. About the structure of the event today, Mo will be presenting her talk for about 30 to 45 minutes, after which uh, Dr. Banaj Dr. Bhattacharya and Mo will um, engage in a discussion following her talk after which we will open this up for audience question and answers. If in the meantime, you would like to put in your questions, please use the chat box to do so. And I will take them in order once the discussion is over. So without much further ado, I hand over to Mo to present her talk today on the disinherited Christianity and conversion in Calcutta. Over to you, Mo. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Vasu, for your invitation to present my work at the British Library and for your very warm introduction. I conducted the majority of my research at the BL and it feels like coming back home. My sincere thanks to Professor Bhattacharya for agreeing to moderate this talk. And I know this will be a very generative conversation. And as I said, I'm very grateful to all of you, my audience, for being here with me. I'm just going to take one second to start the slideshow and then I'll get into my talk. Okay. I want to begin my talk today by ta taking into account cert the certain ways in which Christianity has essentially been, uh, been thought of in Bengal, particularly, especially after the period of 1813. In this main slide that you have here, what you see is essentially a, 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 a painting by the Bengali painter Jamini Roy, which is of the Last Supper. Jamini Roy belonged to a generation of Bengalis who had some sort of understanding of Christianity especially because Calcutta itself was very, very deeply entangled in the evangelical mission in the 19th and early 20th century. In his own memoirs, Shamini Roy says that he had never ever seen the Bible or read it, but he had heard enough stories and had gone to enough churches that the story of the Bible, the narrative of Christ was something that was imprinted in his heart. And out of that in the 1940s emerges a series of paintings on the Bible, many of which find their way through the British and the American um, soldiers who were stationed in Calcutta for R&R &R into major museums, both in the UK and in the US. What does this tell us? Why do I begin with this? It just, it's just to make sure that we know that there is a particular understanding of Christianity in Bengal, which pervades all spheres, the domestic sphere, the public sphere, the educational pedagogical sphere, and ultimately, the final and most important part of it, the political sphere. And I want to begin my talk today talking about a particular Bengali aristocrat. 
His name was Kali Prashan Noshinko, but he is far more well known to us today as the author of a particularly salacious, very easy, gossipy uh, depiction of Calcutta in the early part of the 19th century. This is known as the Hutum Pattern Naksha, the cadastral map of the Hooting Owl, where he talked about the fads and many different kinds of you know, crazes about particular kinds of fashion among the elite and among the non-elite citizens, the subaltern citizens of Calcutta, one of which was the conversion fad. And he writes in his, in his Hutum Pachar Naksha, which is first published in 1862, about one such event which happened in 1851, so almost at a 10 year remove, if you will. He talks about the huge uproar that is caused in Calcutta and you know, the kind of anxieties that, is, that are generated in Calcutta as a result of the conversion of a young Bengali man known as Ganendra Mohan Tigor, who came from a very, very affluent family. The Tigor surname, of course, most of us know is very well recognizable in Bengal and in the world because it is associated with Rabindranath Tigor, the very first Asian and non-white person, if you will, to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913. But he is talking about a different branch of the family and the cause of the uproar, the cause of the scandal that happens in 1851 is because this young man who is his father's only son and thereby the heir to a very large property essentially converts. And almost as soon as he converts, he marries his converter's daughter. That is, he marries his preceptor, Krishna Mohan Banerjee's daughter. And then as a result of his conversion, his father, Prashanna Kumar Thakur, essentially disinherits him from a fabulously wealthy inheritance. The story that I want to tell you today is essentially about this particular family, but I hope that my talk will in some ways add to our understanding of the ways in which religion had an impact on the economic and the political sphere, not merely on the spiritual domain, which is sometimes very neatly carved out of the you know, outer domain. There has been historiography, the South Asian historiography of the past 40 years or so, almost secularizes the public domain and essentially keeps religion at the center of the inner domain. That is not the case when we look at cases of conversion. And that essentially tells us that religion had an overarching impact upon the ways in which Bengalis in, in Calcutta and in all over India, as a matter of fact, put religion at the center of their political and their personal identities. Personally carried out rituals of faith, often had outsized political uh, fallouts. So what does Hutum Pacha say about this conversion fad? He says that in 1851, the arbiters of Bengali caste system of Hinduism were all up in arms because a young man called Ganendra Mohan Tagore had converted. How was he lured into conversion? Exactly the language that Hutom uses. So he was essentially tricked into it. It is not an inward, deeply held belief. He was lured into it by the promise of the hand of Krishna Mohan Banerjee's daughter very well known as one of Calcutta's beauties. And what was the result of this? His father immediately disinherited him. And then Hutong, the Hooting Owl, goes on to talk about how such things have been happening all over India and equates the case of Ganendra Mohan directly with the case of Dalip Singhji, who was converted to Christianity when he was 14 years old and then set to Britain to become Queen Victoria's godson. This is the same Dalip Singh who was the in inheritor of the Sikh empire and essentially, you know, is a person who hands over the Kohino diamond to, to the queen, which is why it's a part of the crown jewels to this day. So, so Hutong, even at a 10 year remove, essentially is making particular kinds of arguments about Christianity and conversion in India, which today still hold particular kinds of political poignancy. One, of course, is the kind of harm that is done to a collective, like a Hindu community, to the social matrix, to the moral and social capital 
gathered by Hindu aristocrats and the Hindu elite and intelligentsia, which is damaged immediately when a member of those tightly linked communities like Ganendra Mohan step out of the fold. The second point that, that um, Hutam Pancha makes, Ali Prashanga Shingo makes essentially is that it's never a sincere conversion. The language that Kali Prashanna Shingho makes, Uttam Pancha or the Hutingao makes is, he was lured by the promise of certain kinds of very tangible material benefits, in this case, marriage to Krishna Mohan Banerjee's daughter. And essentially, that essentially sent, you know, foregrounds a particular kind of argument about Christianity in Bengal and in India, which is that Christian conversions are not sincere. They are not deeply inwardly felt. They are not a moral conviction. They are essentially always as a result of some, some sort of tangible material benefit. And that is the reason that they are attempted. Okay. So you can, you know, this is this is exactly what he says. You can you can read it here. I'm not, you know, take a minute here to just, just read what he says. Again. If you read this, Kali Prashanna Shingho is making an argument about the fact that even though material benefits are promised by missionaries, conversion essentially means that because people have to go out of the fold, because they no longer have the social and moral capital that they could inherit, because they suffered economic losses as well, they are left in a far more poor condition, spiritually as well as materially, as a result of conversion practices. Is this the only person who talks about conversion in material terms, talks about the insincerity of the idea of conversion? No. If we look at another major Indian figure, Rabindranath Tagore, who I just spoke about, and you know, uh, who was a first Nobel Prize winner, he is writing in 1912, and he writes an essay called Atto Porichai, which essentially means on the self and identity. And there he ruminates on the many different ways in which particular sects and converts can still claim particular kinds of Hindu identity. It is important to remember here that Romitranath Tagore belonged to the Thakur Bari, the Jora Shakur Thakur Bari. The entire family is Brahmo, the monotheistic reformist religious sect that was founded by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, nurtured by Tagore's own father, Devendranath Thakur, and essentially, you know, a particular understanding of Hindu religion, which separated them from orthodox practices of rituals and traditions. What Ramitranath Tagore is doing here in the Tattva Bodhini Gotrika in 1912, is he's trying to claim that there is a particular kind of cultural, cultural, uh, identity which adheres to religiosity. And even if a person were to convert, that cultural identity does not ever go away. How does he then talk about conversion? And he directly mentions his, you know, uh, Ganendra Mohan Tagore, who was his second cousin, by the way, just as the Jorashako Tagore family was Brahmo, the Bathuriya Hatta Tagore family, the other branch of the family were very, very orthodox Hindus. And what does, what does Rabindranath say about this cousin twice removed? He talks in tones of deep pity, but at the same time, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of um, conclusions that he comes to about Christianity and Christian conversion very neatly line up with Uttam Pancha, who came almost half a century before him. And there he talks about Christianity is something that is like cloth, that is like a, like a dress or a shirt that you would wear and then discard. But Hinduism was deeply ingrained in something within the soul. Again, Ramadranath himself, a very, very thoughtful and in many ways a very Catholic and liberal thinker about religion, essentially pins Christianity or conversion through Christianity especially evangelical Protestant Christianity in Bengal, as something that is as easily worn and as easily discarded as clothing. It is not something that is organic. 
it is not something that adheres to or has any sort of nuance for a person's soul, but essentially people undertake it again as something that is as easily discarded as it is worn. Why does he do this? Why is there this particular kind of understanding of Christianity as something that is not deeply and broadly felt? For this, I think we need to talk a little bit about the context behind Ganendra Mohan's conversion and the ways in which the events of his life tell us something about the times and, and the political controversies of, of, of British East India Company in the early part of the 19th century. And this is, this is Tagore talking about Akhtar Porichai, again, Hindus in a communitarian sense, but Christian by their religion. He is not only talking about Ganendra Mohan, he is talking about Ganendra Mohan's father-in-law, Krishna Mohan Banerjee, who had converted him. And he is essentially saying, if, if you become a Christian, there is no way to find your place in society. The only way you can claim that is through a cultural affinity and a deeply inwardly felt connection to Hinduism rooted in the religion of one's forefathers, which is not possible with Christian conversion. That translation is inadmissible in the understanding of Atva Borichai or identity as Rabindranath Tagore frames it. So as I said, we should talk a little bit about, you know, the context of Ganendra Mohan's own life, the political situation in the East India Company's government, government in the early part of the 19th century, and I want to do that again with something that is very tangible and material. On the screen before you, you see a emerald ring with intaglio work, essentially meaning the soft stone is carved with particular details. If you look at the border, you will find the name Prashanna Kumar Tagore engraved there. This is a signet ring, one that essentially bore the authority of the person wearing it and was used as a seal. And this was auctioned by Bonhams, the uh, auction house in London in 2015 for about uh, 28,750 British pounds. It had come from the estate of um, Colin Tennant, Baron Glenn Connor, who makes an appearance in the TV series, The Crown as one of the you know, eccentric Bohemian friends of, of, um, of the royal family. Uh, essentially, this comes from his estate, but the name that it bears is the name of Ganendra Mohan's father. I called up Bonhams, asking them about the provenance, and they're usually very, very tight-lipped about it. But they said that at some point in the early 20th century, this ring had come into the possession of Baron Glen Connor. So how does a ring of an Indian elite landlord aristocrat come from India to Britain, pass into the hands of the British aristocrat, and then is auctioned off as, as a Mughal curiosity, as, as Bonhams calls it, in, in, the, in the early part of the 21st century. What is the way in which this ring makes its journey across the ocean? My first and foremost thought was that it must have come through the son, Ganendra Mohan, who we know had you know, spent a very large part of his life in England at London. But when I started digging into the archives, I came across a Bengali gemological treatise, which said that this ring, the signet ring, had been in the possession of Ganendra, of Ganendra Mohan's cousin, Jyotindra Mohan Tagore, who had inherited it from his uncle, Shunnokuma, Ganendra Mohan's father, who also inherited all the property that Prashanna Kumar did not pass on to his son. So in some way, symbolically, the signet ring, the idea, you know, the, the, the symbol of authority passed not from Prashanna Kumar to his son, but passed from Prashanna Kumar to his nephew, Jyotindra Mohan Tagore. At some point, the, the descendants of Jyotindra Mohan Tagore sold this to someone in England, and thereby it you know, reached its inevitable conclusion at the Bonham's auction. How do we trust that this is actually the case? The person who writes this gemological treatise is another nephew of Prashanna Kumar Tagore, another cousin of Ganendra Mohan Tagore, the younger brother of Jyotindra Mohan who inherited the ring, a, a man called Shorindra Mohan Tagore who is much more well known as a musicological expert but he makes a point of putting this in his gemological treatise in order to show the legitimacy 
of the inheritance of the Pathuriya Ghata Tagore family passing from Prashanna Kumar to Jyotindra Mohan, not to the converted son, Gyanendra Mohan Tagore. We already understand that there are material losses and losses of authority, losses of social and moral capital that are encapsulated by this kind of passage, this kind of inheritance, which is slant-wise instead of the normal, normal way in which it should happen. And this is Jyotindra Mohan Tagore in his old age. He received a title from the British government, whereby his, he, he was called Maharaja. He played in an immensely important role in being one of the staunch supporters of the British government in the later part of the 19th century. He was at the forefront in 1885 of the, of the rent laws, the reforms in the rent laws that essentially stops the rack and rent and, and, and the, and the uh, troubled usage of the peasantry by the, by the aristocracy and by the landholders. He is an important figure. And again, very much like photography of any royal figure from the 19th century, here he is in full regalia, prepared to go to the Darbar. So what is happening here? As I said, there is a slant in the way in which inheritance should actually occur. Particular kinds of Christian conversion already make it clear that inheritance does not pass from father to son. Is this something that is there and supported within British law and within Hindu understandings of inheritance? That is something that we need to discuss a little bit. This is one of the earliest maps of Calcutta. And as you can see, you know, everything in the story is set in Calcutta. The kind of, uh, kind of uh, lotus-like structure that you see near the right-hand corner of the, of the screen essentially is the Fort William which out of which all the British executive, legislative and judiciary services were provided to the British people. If you go a little further to the north near the green spaces, as you can see across, across the very wide swath of the Moidan, as it is called in Kolkata, you find exactly the places where Gyanendra Mohan, Jyotindra Mohan, Prashanda Kumar and others lived and worked and created you know, their space within the second city of the British Empire. What else was happening in the spaces? Printing presses, political pamphleteers, um, book selling stores, missionary and government run schools and colleges were all flourishing and jostling for space and importance. It is in this, you know, Northern corner, straight up from the Fort William, which creates this particular kind of linear connection spatially between these two spaces that the story unfolds. And I mentioned printing presses and schools especially because in many ways when in young Indian men understand that they have to learn English in order to succeed in the new British government after 1835 and Macaulay's minute, they have to go to schools Government schools are very few in number because the British government sets aside only a mere lakh rupees or 100,000 rupees for the purpose. The British government finds it far cheaper to hand out certain kinds of funds to missionary institutions who then take it upon themselves to teach the students in British mores and manners, talk to them about the enlightenment, the very long shadow of the enlightenment, that creeps into India at a very, very so, slow pace. Talk to them about the radical ideas of people like Adam Smith, Smith and Tom Paine and others. But at the same time, missionary institutions allow certain kinds of activities between preceptors and students, which are not allowed in government schools. And that is the freedom to, to preach to students. Essentially, for many, many Bengali men and later in the century Bengali women, their first understanding of Christianity and their first contact with evangelism happens in these schools. The first wave of this, of course, starts after 1813-1813, when the Charter of the British East India Company is renewed. And for the very first time, supported by William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist, we have permission for British missionaries to preach in British Indian domains. By 1830, what this has meant is an influx of a number of very, very well-educated 
missionaries coming to India with the objective of converting all of India within a short space of time. Where do they find their objects of conversion or the subjects of their conversion? They find them in the schools and colleges and institutions in these metropolitan cities, most important of which is Calcutta, which is the capital of the British government, and essentially after London, the largest city of the British Empire. Okay. And one of those men who come into Calcutta, one of those missionaries who comes to Calcutta in 1830, is a man called Alexander Tuff, who is a Scottish missionary and who essentially is the figurehead of the Scottish schism, sh sh meaning he's a part of the new reformative, uh, reformative Scottish church. He sets up a number of institutions in Calcutta, including the General Assembly's institution, which later on goes on to become the Scottish Church College, still functioning as one of the most important liberal humanities uh, educational institutions in, in the country, in the country of India. So Alexander Duff, Scottish missionary, makes this journey to Calcutta. On the way, according to his own biography, he is shipwrecked twice. And in a miraculous, you know, miraculous way, his life is saved. And the only thing that he can save from all of this luggage is his Bible. He steps in Calcutta in 1830, immediately gives a number of interviews, as you would, to announce your presence. And immediately, you know, gives a number of interviews to say, I'm going to convert all of Calcutta within a year. Though this amazing ambition is never fulfilled, he nevertheless manages to convert a handful of about 100 people, usually high caste Hindu Bengali men, who go on to form the backbone in many ways of Bengali convert Christian society. He also converts a number of people, Indians, who go on to have important missionary careers of their own. One of them is Krishna Mohan Banerjee, who later on goes on to convert Ganendra Mohan Tagore and whose daughter Ganendra Mohan Tagore marries. Why else is uh, Alexander Duff so very important in trying to understand the context of Ganendra Mohan's own conversion 20 years after Duff's arrival in India? From the very beginning, Duff understands that if loss of ancestral property, if loss of inheritance cannot be stopped when Indians convert, it means it is a disincent disincentive to Indians to actually convert. So from the period of the 1830s to the period of the 1850s, Alexander Duff, other than having an immense, you know, outsized impact on the Indian educational system, also essentially continually makes this uh, important, um, you know, interventions in the change of inheritance laws in Calcutta. His, his influence is not taken in a very, you know, in, in a good way by anyone in Bengal, especially of the elite, in, in elite and intelligentsia, the Bengali uh, aristocratic families, and a number of people, you know, either write pamphlets threatening him, a number of aristocrats threaten to send assassins after him, latials or people holding clubs after him. And Isha Chandra Gupta, one of the earliest vernacular editors of a Bengali newspaper, prints this scurrilous poem, which with, with its hymns of, you know, uh, prohibited sex, sexuality, prohibited enchantments of the missionary, missionaryism, as it used to be called in his, in his newspaper. And he essentially talks about the way in which Hinduism itself is in complete disrepair. And everyone is taking a dip in Duff's cup of love essentially meaning that, you know, in, in some ways, the younger generation of Bengal's most important families were at complete and total risk from activities by people like Duff. This should also tell us something about the outsized anxiety that conversion efforts in Calcutta and in Bengal and widely in India, uh, you know, foment. Numbers, as I said, over a 20 year period are only about 100. But the anxiety that happens is completely out of proportion. In India, there is not a conversion crisis with a conversion panic. And as I said, this is the total number of people that, you know, all the educational institutions run by evangelical, uh, evangelical uh, missionary um, 
missionaries essentially do. Government schools, 27. London Missionary School, 14. Baptist Missionary Society, five. Church Missionary Society, which is a society under which Canon Ramon converted, 17. Free Church Institution, Alexander Duff, 29. Educated in the Free Church Institution, but baptized elsewhere, eight. Church of Scotland, 27. So a total of 107 people over a 20 year period, but the anxiety that is fomented in Bengali society is completely outsized. And as I said, Duff from the very beginning understands that there is a great need to stop loss of inheritance for these Bengali men once they make a decision to convert. Uh, essentially, the loss of inheritance would mean that most people would not want to convert. And this has a lot to do with the way in which British law is evolving in India as well. Until the middle of the 1930s, it is the Daibhag, which is a Hindu codex, which is taken as a basis on which property can be partitioned. And according to it, from generation to generation, it is the father of the, of the family, the head of the family, who has the right to alienate property as he wished, essentially paving the path for certain recalcitrant children who would not agree to certain kinds of, you know, um, certain kinds of rites and rituals of particular families to be made that jar essentially discarded out of the family. This was the provision that was being used by Hindu fathers when they were disinheriting their sons. What happens with this kind of pamphleteering by Alexander Duff and others? Uh, this comes out in 1831 from the Baptist Mission Press, but is written by Alexander Duff, essentially, you know, who's from the Free Church, Free Church Institution. So all missionary, uh, you know, institutions in India, in Bengal, are very, very deeply invested in this. Essentially, this leads to the passage of what is known as the Lex Loci, or Law of the Land Act, which passes as Act 21 in 1950 exactly a year before Ganendra Mohan himself converts, which takes away the right of alienation of property from the Hindu father. What it does instead is make a provision which says that the Hindu father essentially cannot alienate ancestral properties, meaning something which has been in the family through generations, cannot alienate because the child comes into that inheritance at the moment of his birth. If it is the father's own personal inheritance, he can do whatever he wish with it, but ancestral inheritances cannot be alienated from the children. This is act, this act, the Lex Loci Act or Act 21 of 1850 is also known as the Caste Disabilities Removal Act. This paves the way for a wider wave of missionary conversions in and around 1850 and 51 across India, and this would go on to have the effect of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan writing in his reasons for the, for the cause of the 1857-58 mutiny, the, the kind of you know, interference in the modes and manners of lives of Hindus and Muslims by, evangel by, uh, by, by evangelical efforts of, of missionaries, especially through schools. So the pedagogical institution, the political institution, and the evangelical effort in India are very, very closely tied together to an understanding by the Hindu community that there was a real and present threat to their way of life. And that the British government, in, in, in a way going against its promise to the Indian population that, it, that had been given since 1757 of non-interference, had gone back on its words and was using its soft power to make it possible for this kind of you know, paving the path for, for um, this kind of paving the path for conversion efforts. And this is the, this is the Lex Loci or Caste Disabilities Removal Act. What does it say? They cannot by reason of their renouncing or having been excluded from the communion of any religion be alienated from their properties. Meaning even if they converted, the parents really had no other way of making sure that they could, or, and the community had no other way of making sure that they could actually make certain kinds of um, certain kinds of um, punishments available for for recalcitrant 
children like this. What is the result of all of this? Of course, you know, more and more the Bengali printing press, the vernacular printing press starts talking about the ways in which young men are being taken away from their families. And the question is then hurt sentiments, which is something which is peculiarly tricky in the way in which it is encoded in the Indian Indian Penal Code, but it emerges out of this kind of, you know, caste disabilities removal, paving the way for larger, larger numbers of conversions. And essentially what Akhoi Kumar Dotto, the great rationalist says when he's writing in the Dotto Bodhini Bhutrika, is that this has been a source of immense hurt and betrayal, not, not only at the familial level, but at the communitarian level and at the political level. So how do we, how do we place Gyanendra Mohan in this story? How do, we, how do we talk about him in this story? Essentially, most of, the, most of the material that we have on him that I, that I found is at the British Library, including this you know, series of series of letters. And this is where the story of the Indian Renaissance, if you will, and the story of abolitionism come together in a very, very surprising way. George Thompson, very well-known uh, radical abolitionist, uh, essentially takes two trips to India, first in 1843 at the invitation of the, of the Tagore family when he stays with Prashanna Kumar Tagore, Ganendra Mohan's father, and takes part in Ganendra Mohan's first marriage. And then again in 1856, when he comes back for another visit and finds that everything has changed in the, in the, in the intervening period of 13, 14 years, starts writing this immensely long letters to his daughter, Amelia Cheston, back in England, and the title of his letter about Ganendra Mohan Tagore is The Disinherited. Most of the way, most of the information that we have about the inner domains of the, of the Tagore family in Pakuriyagata, suffering the loss of the son and heir is, is, is through this letter and through a series of, through a series of uh, pamphlets that, that talk about the two major protagonists, Ganendra Mohan and his first wife, Bala Shundari Tagore. Bala Shundari and Ganendra Mohan's life, as it is told by, uh, told by um, George Thompson, is one of bibliophilia. It's a particular kind of Bildungsroman, if you will, a growing up story of a husband and wife, where they essentially undertake a particular kind of translation project, that of the soul, that of the spirit, through voracious reading. Gyanendra Mohan is very well educated because he's a son and heir of the Pathuriya Ghatta family. But Prashanna Kumar assigns a British uh, governess for his young daughter-in-law through whom she learns to read English. And the first book that she reads with her husband essentially is, is The Pilgrim's Progress. Then she reads uh, the, the Methodist call for renewed evangelism which becomes very, very important in the later part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century. She goes on consistently reading a number of pamphlets about the, the goodness of Christianity versus the superstitious darkness of Hinduism. And from the letter, it seems very, very clear that this little girl who enters the Tagore family at age nine and dies at the age of 16 is very significantly important to Ganendra Mohan's own steps towards conversion. How does this happen? We find for the very first time, Bengali women being given their own voice. And I cannot stress this enough. The first autobiography of a Bengali woman, Rashundari Devi's Aar Gotha, my, my words, comes out in 1876. Ganand, uh, George Thompson is writing about Ganendra Mohan and Bala Shundari in 1856, 20 years before the publication of the Bengali woman's autobiography. And what is his voice? It is a very stern, determined voice of someone that is very, very young, who says to her husband over and over again, renounce this you know, affection towards Hinduism, renounce this affection towards your father, towards you know, the comforts of this great wealth that you've been born into. Choose to be a Christian because that is the only way in which you can have salvation. She contracts consumption because, of course, the activities of this young couple are not hidden from the wider family, which in 1851 is counted at 200 members. And uh, Bala Shundari is over and over again told by her mother-in-law that she should renounce her heathenish ways and take into account the, the long-established Hindu traditions and rituals that are at her home. As a result of this, 
George Thompson says she confronts a very Victorian romantic disease of consumption. And essentially, that is why she wants to, you know, um, that is why, you know, she has this rapid consumption tuberculosis. Just before dying, she wants to be baptized. Of course, it's not possible. Uh, Prashna Kumar Tagore does not allow anyone to enter into this inner, inner sanctum, but she tells her husband, I die a Christian. This is the story embellished by many different kinds of details over the next 50 years, almost always coming from Ganendra Mohan, which go on to lionize the way in which Ganendra Mohan takes its decision to become a Christian. And what are the kinds of pamphlets that are being produced? We have the Eastern BB Gathered, for example, a memoir of Bala Shundari Tagore by Edward Storo, who would himself go on to um, convert a number of young Bengali boys. We have a number of other pamphlets where, again, Bala Shundari seems the catalyst for Ganendra Mohan's heroic renunciation of his patrimony. But that is not actually the case as, as uh, George Thompson tells us. Ganendra Mohan is told by his preceptor, Krishna Mohan Banerjee, to wait until the passage of the Caste Disabilities Removal Act or the Lex Loci Act of 1850-51. Unfortunately, Bala Shundari dies right before this law is passed. As soon as this law is passed, Krishna Mohan Banerjee, who was one of Ganendra Mohan's preceptors at Bishop's College, essentially takes it upon himself to help this young man convert. There are a number of, you know, um, local newspapers like the evangelical record, the, the missionary mouthpiece of the, of the Sarampur, Sarampur Baptist, the, the friend of India, all of which say that, uh, that um, Prashanna Kumar Tagore keeps on trying to tell his son, do whatever you wish to do in public, uh, in, in private, don't convert publicly, tells him that he's going to settle 2000 pounds onto him for every month as, 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 as an allowance and essentially tries his level best to stop his son from taking that very, very public step. It does not work because in a way there is this now legal safeguard which tells Prashanna, which, which tells Prashanna Kumar Tagore and which tells Ganendra Mohan as well that there is nothing that his father can actually do in order to disinherit him. He takes that step and his father essentially starts first the traditional methods of disinheritance which is an erasure of Ganendra Mohan from the family's, uh, from the family's uh, doc, you know, records and documents from the genealogical books. So even today, if you take up something from the Tagore family of Pathuryaghata or from the Duranshapur family, you will find him either not mentioned as if he was never you know, present, as if he had never been born or one single statement, he converted to Christianity. That is the entirety of his presence within this genealogical records. This was something that is very, very common across families, which is why it's so very hard to, you know, retrieve this kind of convert voices from the archive as well. The second step that Prashanna Kumar takes, other than, you know, erasing his son out of the genealogical records, is, is to create an entail on his estate, something that had never, ever been done before. He makes the argument that the properties need to pass on to his nephew, Jyotindra Mohan Tagore, because Jyotindra Mohan would be able to take part in the traditional rites and rituals, including the last rites of his uncle, which would make him a legitimate inheritor of the properties and creates the conditions of the entail according to British law. This had never ever been done before in India. What is the result of this? We have the great Tagore will case, which goes on from 1867, immediately after Prashanna Kumar's death, to 1882, it goes up to the Privy Council, at which point, you know, the decision that is made is Jyotindra Mohan would have a life interest in the properties. Once Jyotindra Mohan passed away, the properties would revert back to Ganendra Mohan Tagore. Something else happens that makes, you know, any, any kind of rapprochement between son and father completely impossible. And this is what I began my talk with. This very, you know, poorly preserved photograph, as you can see, the woman in a black gown sitting down, 
is Krishna Mohan Banerjee's daughter, uh, Komola, who uh, Ganendra Mohan married. And, you know, essentially it is this marriage and children from this marriage that hurt Prashanna Kumar and the prestige of the Bhatriya Bhatta family in a particular way which makes any kind of rapprochement completely impossible. What happens to this, to this young Christian convert family? There are a number of graves in and around Bishop's College, which essentially is now the Shippur Engineering College in, in Calcutta. The graveyard is run over with snakes and tall grass. No one is there to take care of it. Pamula Tagore is mentioned only one, uh, once or twice. Her grave is in the, in the Park Street Cemetery. I have not been able to find it. Many people say that it was completely destroyed. Ganendra Mohan himself died in the early 1890s, so he did not outlive his cousin. His only daughter, Shottendra Bala, surviving daughter, passed on the properties to, to, the, to, to the cousin, Shottendra Mohan Tagore, because he outlived his, uh, Ganendra Mohan's entire family. And so it ultimately comes down to a question of inheritance. It comes down to a story of two wills. This is the record of Prashanna Kumar's, Kumar's will in the Wills and Probate Papers, where he says, there's just one sentence regarding this beloved son, where he says, I have made provisions for him and he will receive nothing whatsoever under this my will. This is a man who makes provisions for the Tagore Law Lectures, among other things, you know, donating more than 300,000 rupees to the Calcutta, Calcutta University and those lectures are continuing to, to this day. It just erases his son, both out of the genealogy and out of any inheritance that he might have had. Prashanna Kumar does this, but in 1882, when the Privy Council decides that, you know, there can be a reversion of the estates back to Ganendra Mohan, Ganendra Mohan starts writing over and over again that he is the heir in reversion to Prashanna Kumar. So on one hand, there is this desire to erase. On the other hand, there is this very strong clinging on to a particular kind of identity. Galindra Mohan spends most of his last years as a teacher of Hindu law at, at London University, and he, he gives a lecture, one of his lectures is recorded. It is to the native Christians of India, where he talks about religion and the impact of religion. And he talks about the way in which it is the realization of the moral life of a nation in corporate form. He stresses that a change of religion does not mean that there is a change of nationality and patriotism especially Christian conversions mean people can be more nationalist and patriot patriotistic, which is essentially against the nascent rise of, Hind of, of Indian nationalism in the way we understand it. Ganendra Mohan's national nationalism and patriotism is very geared towards the support of the British government. The way in which nationalism starts being defined from the late 19th century is very, very different from this. What does Ganendra Mohan say in his own will? He again mentions his father very, very briefly, one sentence, where he just says, you know, he made no provisions for me, his only son. And the way in which this is written, the rest of the language of this will is very, very, you know, dry legalese. But that one sentence there should, should give you a sense of the kind of abandonment that the son felt and the kind of disjunct from his own community that he felt as a result of this disinheritance. Shottendra Bala, Bala, as I said, the only surviving daughter of GM Tagore, essentially, you know, uh, has this, has this uh, poignant letter written in 1905, where she is importunating the British crown to, to you know, show her support so that she does not have to sign over her father's properties to his cousin, Jyotindra Mohan. It does not happen. She, you know, signs it over for a pittance and dies soon after of breast cancer. The entire family is essentially wiped out within the course of 40 years or so. Again, in this letter, you can find the very strong desire to claim a kind of Brahmin identity, claim a particular kind of Indian identity, which was erased as a result of the conversion. So what can this tell us about conversion, you know, about conversion in India and about Christianity in India? On one hand, over and over again, Indian interlocutors, Indian intelligentsia, characterize Christianity and conversion as insincere, as a result of material gains. 
the entire community creates a particular kind of hardened monolithic identity as a result of their profound anxieties and, and profoundly hostile reaction to Christian conversions. On the other hand, Christian converts keep on trying to make this, make this plea that, that they, are not, they, they do not exhibit mutilated selves, that they are as much Indian, as much tied to their communities of birth, that there, there are possibilities of multiple kinds of ideas of identity that might exist. Why do I show you this picture of, of this burnt church? This is you know, from the early 2010s. Essentially, you know, the ransacking of the, of, 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 of the church of James Skinner in Delhi. What this shows is you know, this kind of insincere, the, the idea of insincere motives, the idea of material benefits accruing to Christianity is a narrative that has been flagrantly used by the current religious dispensation, uh, political dispensation, Hindu right-wing dispensation in India which creates these conditions where it says no one can be a true Christian. They are only rice Christians. And as a result, you know, they can be reconverted, karwapasi, if you will. The other result, of course, is to think of Indian Christians who have almost uh, as long a history in India as that of Christianity itself, as outsiders and enemies. And this is the result of that, vandalizing, taking away parts of their identity, never ever thinking of them as belonging to the mainstream of, of the Indian nation. I will stop my talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mo, for that fascinating presentation and for you know, connecting it uh, so well with uh, the political situation, the religious situation. Um, not just in India, but in post-colonial South Asia at the moment. So thank you very much for that. And uh, your talk um, was so pertinent to our project itself, Two Centuries of Indian Print, precisely because uh, we have already digitized and made available online so many Christian tracts in translation, in yes. English, and it, this is all readily available for users to download and you know consult online. So I won't take up uh, any more time, and I would like to invite... Uh, Devjani Bhattacharya uh, to have a discussion with Mo. And in the meanwhile, if the audience wants to put in their questions, please use the chat box for that and we'll take them after the discussion. Over to you, Devjan. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka, for that introduction and also for gathering us together and allowing me the chance to uh, comment and engage with Dr. Mo Banerjee's really extraordinarily rich and generative work. I was actually lucky to read the whole paper, which I enjoyed thoroughly. And I'm really, really excited for her upcoming book. So with that, I want to commend you on this wonderful paper and uh, for presenting this historical narrative of elite conversion in Calcutta that in some ways I thought uh, is beautifully pulsating with the temper of the movement. And I think it came out very nicely when you laid out that slide of Calcutta, mapping the spatiality of the debate and the sense of loss, inheritance, and that story. Uh, so I really loved it. And as someone who, like Mo, was trained, and I'm calling you Mo, I hope that's okay, oh, please, in both yes. literature and history, I also appreciated what you did in this paper. It is in some ways a methodological masterpiece in navigating between, I thought, in the written paper, the three registers of the literary, the epistolar, epistolary, and the historical. In some ways, I, I, my students often ask me how to use literature to do historical work. And I always say that literature can be the nose that allows you to sniff out the events that take on somewhat epochal or historical ramifications within the everyday folds of the moment you're investigating. And in some ways, Mo, I think your paper sort of is the best example to elucidate what I keep telling my students. So I really love it. So what Mo does for us is uh, historicize conversion, hurt, loss, and in this loss prop community, of, in, of uh, wealth, of material and social worlds in not just colonial India, but it allows us a glimpse into understanding what's, what is happening in the post-colonial moment. And by really going, to this, uh, going through, through this really deep and contextual reading of the Tagore will, you are really opening up uh, entire histories of like kind of erasure, kind of forgetting uh, that puts this last slide uh, in some ways, like puts this last side into relief 
of what exactly is going on in this uh, uh, in these stories from that begin you look at in the early 18th early 19th century and continue i will not summarize this rich work but i will think of like ask you to think with me about a few points um, and that came to my head and i am sorry i will begin with property because and i know yes. like this is people say devjani if, if you put devjani into conversation property is what she begins with I, but anyway it, it's really made me think of the relation between conversion and wealth and i i liked what you did uh, was you begin by saying like you know the the fact that hutum and everybody talks about reach conversion or misreads conversion as kind of a, as a, as a cynical move as an insincere move as a move all located within the material world and how do we move away from that and try to understand it in all its interiority all its spiritual understanding on what exactly is the the communion between the individual and their understanding of god or spirituality or the bible or the church or whatever that might be and you say how do we begin from this misreading to really go somewhere else and i th- i thought it was amazing what you do and i really like the way you keep both the both the spiritual world of the husband wife uh, of of ganendra mohan uh, his loss of community and the material together but for me i think it also raises a kind of a interesting methodological question so what happens then if we want to go beyond this moment of misreading but yet our analytic and our historical lens is the precisely because of the way the debate has uh, unfolded and what has left what are the archival traces that are left begins from property and law begins from the will so i want you to think about the relation between the rubric of the will that allows you to enter the story the space of law and legal anxiety that you unpack to think through the religious anxieties and the emotional world of the religion that you are uh, uh, that you are sort of unpacking this made me think of can we have a, also a cynical reading of the lex loci act and i don't i haven't read the act so i might be completely wrong but you know i thought like okay this is alexander duff is invested in converting elites right and uh, of course you you think about the kind of disciples you're bringing into your fold of course you christianity will bring in poor like the wouldn't distinguish between wealth and uh, uh, wealth and uh, uh, poverty but the idea is what happens when uh, uh, wealthy disciples come into your fold and come in with their properties what sort of uh establishment of schools are enable what sort of and again i'm i'm doing exactly the kind of cynical reading of duff's intention that you are telling us do not do of maybe ganendra mohan and bala's intention but i'm trying to understand can we if we continue to like what you are doing is you are asking us to say religious conversion and wealth are two stories we need to pay attention together but not read in some ways in a cynical manner but i'm trying to also do then how do we read this act together with uh not just like you know protecting the converted but also thinking through what it does for the church and the missionaries so that's one large question i was trying to think through um uh two sort of two one large question and a nested question then the other thing uh i really thought you did a beautiful job because you would not let us uh settle down on what is interiority and privacy and what is public yes. and if you bring you really like you say you no know, these are not like let us be careful because these are not concepts even if these are concepts we think mm-hmm. we know your paper sort of defamiliarizes us because uh, because in one way this um, the uh, bala spiritual awakening is very much a kind of a personal awakening but very, very much through her reading through her thinking she comes it, it is something that happens within this conjugal family of the husband and the wife they are talking about it they are thinking through it and it is very much a textual you know it's this kind of as you say she's a she reads and she thinks through it's a kind of a, a strong uh, strong will woman who's trying to under develop her interiority and it is very much the bildungs roman kind of a motive through which one may read that and yet what is very interesting is like there is this other world that she t- tries to renounce the world of the hindu tradition the world of worship the ritual that is playing out within the interior circles of the family so there is there is that kind of a semi privatized semi public space and then there is the public act of conversion that she asks her um, husband to do and there are two things happening so prashanna kumar is saying it's all right keep your religion private don't make it a public so here i kept thinking what is how do we map on this public and private 
in some sense, sometimes I feel maybe the Hindu traditions feel like a public religion, whereas Christianity feels are really public. And then I say, no, Mo would not let me settle on that. And then I think, oh, this is the like the family versus the church or the missionaries. But then that is also not the case. So I think there is something interesting going on in the way what your text and your reading of this moment is doing to the question of public private and precisely because there's so much written within South Asia and I'm thinking through Tony Kashorka's work, Parthu Chatterjee's work on the question of the public private and you're completely like opening up this question really on you by entering through the act of uh, Ganendra uh, Mohan's uh, public conversion, which also made me think a little bit of the question of gender. How do we read, you know, like ba Bala is mm -hmm. central to his, um, his conversion. Although Bala's father uh, is the reverend who's do, doing that, but the really the, that uh, the, if you want to read the way they both think about their theology, they develop their theology. The, and in, in your paper, you beautifully bring it out how they go from a unita, unita, unitarian thinking to a trinitarian thinking through Bala's kind of engagement in some ways. I was thinking, how do we read this? Because when Bala is talking to him, Bala says, give up your religion. And in a same line, she said, give up your father and give up your wealth. So what is Bala saying? How do we read Bala's giving up where she equates these three things together? And if we have our gender lens on us, what, how do we read this daughter-in-law, strong-willed, educated, uh, uh, comes from, as you pointed, a socially much more upward caste uh, than the Tagore's, is demanding of her husband in within the conjugal you know within the entire writing of this conjugal mar marriage what is she what, what how do we read this moment of um uh, of of her gender demands on her marriage and her paternal family and its relation to um and christianity so there is and then the last thing and i, I like I, I want to end because i see there are already 10 questions here the last thing i was thinking about the brahmin christian that ganendra mohan invokes the Hindu Christian that Tagore invokes in Atapurichai, are they the same thing? And what's exactly happening? Because, you know, because Ganendra Mohan side wants to keep the Brahmin identity intact. He's the Brahmin Christian. Shurendra Bala wants to remain the Brahmin. Whereas Tagore is thinking through a Hindu Christian. Maybe it's interchangeably used as the literature might suggest, you know, in the mid-19th century Hindu Brahmin often ends up being the same thing. Which also got me thinking about, you know, someone like Sanal Mohan's work. On the modernity of slavery, and you are saying if the if this if the the convert this Brahmin Christian Hindu Christian and where Sanal would say the Dalit Christian is the site to understand the question of modernity, the convert who is kind of destabilizing all this. How do we then place your story of elite conversion with the story of you know Dalit Christianity that people are writing with the way they are reading the moment of conversion that they are reading uh, what Protestant missionaries are doing. How do you place these two together? And, uh, and finally, I was thinking, and I think you begin to do that at the end of the paper, how your work in some ways allows us to reflect, because your paper is very much on the social violence, the material violence. And in some ways in the post-colonial moment, we are actually seeing physical violence, right? Yes. In some ways. And I think you really, really allow us to understand that there's a longer history to this physical violence. And physical violence is, um, is, is a culmination of the kind of long history of social, economic, political violence that has been taking place for a long time. So I, I really thought this was really, really amazing, very, very rich, very generative, and, and I'll end over here. Thank you so much more for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Thank you, Devjani, for this absolutely wonderful series of questions. Uh, you know. I will, because we have so many questions in the chat as well, I just very want to quickly talk about, talk about, you know, a few of the points that you raised, which are also very, very important. One is, of course, the question of the interiority and the exteriority of the self. And in many ways, when, you know, we talk about a public self and a private self, we discount the ways in which this kind of division probably does not exist in the way we live our lives. This is theoretically very generative, perhaps, or was generative in the last 30 years or so. But once we start thinking about it in realistic terms, no human being leave, lives one particular kind of life completely separated from their public identity. What is happening in the case of Christian conversion is that kind of division 
now needs to be reinforced both by the Hindu community and by the Christian evangelical project because that translation has to be public for it to count, which is why Bala's understanding of herself, Bala's creation of this gendered identity for herself in terms of making her own decisions strikes me very, very, you know, strikes me as something that is completely revolutionary because in some way she's not only transgressing that interiority, that understanding of the interiorization and the public performance of a particular kind of piety, she's essentially attaching that to particular kinds of cultural, traditional, familial understanding of the role of a woman within the Hindu traditional family. And she's stepping out of it and asking her husband to step out of it as well. This is not the Indian woman on whose body a particular kind of history can be written. She is not the mute subject of the history, nationalist history making. Most conversion narratives, when they talk about the women, kind of privilege this sort of self-making, which is then generated for that public performance of the self. And in some way, erasing that kind of division between the private and the public. This is very, very important. I have seen at least three papers who talk about Bala Shundari without any kind of, you know, attention towards the fact that she comes from this particular kind of background. She is not merely a figure in this evangelical, you know, pamphlets as this generative ideal Zanana convert woman, that there is a historical background to her coming from an orthodox, but very highly influential aristocratic family like the Pakunyatala family which grounds in particular ways the ways in which she thinks of herself and her relationship to faith, which I think is something that needs to be taken seriously, not only in the ways in which we talk about Indian women of gender, gender history, but also in the way we think about conversion. The women are not there to be props. That is, that is, that is something that I want to bring to say. The second question, of course, is this connection between you know, property, between conversion, you know, the, the space of legal and, uh, and, and other anxieties which connect, you know, and I really like the way you say that, can we do a cynical reading of this? Yes. I mean, the entire project is beset with cynicism in particular ways, which I think has done immense harm to the understanding of the space of minorities within India itself. We all sort of think of Bonkin Chandra Chatterjee and, and Ananda Mott and Bishbrikko in 1880, as a moment in which, you know, the other to the Indian nationalist, you know, identity, the Hindu, the Hindu religious identity, which is essentially secularized, starts happening. It happens much, much earlier in the decade beginning with the 1820s and 30s when people like Ram Mohan Roy and Alexander Duff are starting to talk about the ways in which particular kinds of relationships between the between spirituality, between between religion, between public performances of particular kinds of identities and between material wealth need to be taken into account. The Lex Loci Act read cynically, and this is the way it is read by every Hindu commentator, is essentially a ploy to actually take the wealth out of this Hindu connected families, bring them into the public domain in such a way that it serves the British government better through these evangelical institutions. What do the evangelical institutions think? There is a huge amount of money which is being spent by the institutions back at home. The CMS, the Church Missionary Society, the London Missionary Society, the Baptist Mission, funnel in a huge amount of money into the Indian mission, at least in this early part of the 19th century. The immediate result of this is this missions trying to find sources of income, which are separate from the home institutions, which would allow them more, you know, a, a more kind of relaxed way in which, in, not relaxed, but more ways in which to understand Indian culture and make the evangelical project better success. One of the ways to do that, of course, is to ensure that anyone who comes into the world, into Christianity, comes with their properties intact, which means that they are not hesitant about conversion, thereby leading to an increase in the numbers of conversions, but it also means materially there is some benefit and that no, the home institutions or the missions no longer have to think about the financial question. The moral part of this question, of course, is because over and over again, missionary institutions are targeted and told that you give out money and you give out material benefits and that is why people convert. Once the Lex Loci Act is passed, they think if people come in with their properties, they are no longer dependent upon these missions. That puts an end to that kind of negative, cynical reading of the evangelical project. 
the fact that someone like uh, you know Prashanna Kumar Tagore is so easily able to subvert it is also a way in which you know we understand that the legal arena becomes another arena of contestation about identities and the ways in which this you know Hindu community is trying to essentially harden the boundaries between itself and those who are you know members of that same community who are therefore greater betrayers and traitors than than anyone who could come from outside. So there is that aspect and the way in which you know Dalit Christian with a hyphen, Brahmin Christian with a hyphen. So many of these people that I have studied over the course of the, of the 19th and early 20th century seem to find their identity connected to that hyphen. It is that particular hyphenated multiple identity which people do not seem to be able to hold on to, especially after 1872 and the census which essentially means that you have to declare only one particular identity and not another. So we have, you know, Ganendra Mohan Tagore calling himself a Brahmin Christian, thereby giving himself not only a Hindu identity, but the most elevated Hindu identity that he could, trying to say that he still had that kind of, you know, you know uh, spiritual ability to care for the traditions and rituals of his own family while at the same time being a Christian. That is related to the clause of, you know, uh, the clause of um, fitness in order to inherit, which, which uh, Prashanna Kumar adds to the will, to the, to the entail that he creates. The second, you know, anybody else who is writing thereafter, for example, Bhavan Charan Bandhapadhyay, who we know as Brahmavandha uh, later on, any of the other bigger names within this, including Bhavani Charan's uncle, to whom Gandhi goes to, Mahatma Gandhi goes to learn about Christianity continuously define themselves as belonging to both their communities of birth and to, their, and to their Christian identity. They do not in any way disentangle those identities. However, both British law and Indian nationalism essentially make sure that that hyphenated identity does not hold any meaning and they have to choose either one or the other. I think in some ways what Dalit Christianity has managed to do, and that has come with you know, liberation theology, that has come with a particular understanding of the political nature of this kind of conversions, is go beyond that loss of the hyphen and create a particular ground, which essentially is not so much for the destabilization of Hindu communities, but for creating a particular kind of identity politically more upwardly mobile and they were able to gather more resources, which in the 19th and early 20th century, these converted Christians never managed to do. But we can have other, you know, more discussions about your absolutely fantastic questions later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mo. I think there are loads of questions waiting for you and they have started coming in mm -hmm. um, when the discussions were on. And the first question, I'm going to take them in order. The first question is by Brian McDonough. Where does the Roman Catholic Church fit into the dynamics you so ably present? The Roman Christian, uh, the Catholic Church in India has a much longer history than that of evangelism, Protestant evangelism. As, as we all know, the you know, Catholic project in India starts with the coming of Vasco da Gama, the coming of the Patroado. It is also more accepting and forgiving of particular kinds of syncretic accommodations, which essentially means if certain communities convert, and this is very, very common in the early history of the church in the, in the, in the 16th and 17th century, for example, where it's not one elite individual, but entire communities who convert to Catholicism. And in many cases, this is essentially because there are very, very charismatic um, Catholic, uh, you know, Catholic preachers, monks, Jesuits who are coming in. I think I saw a question about St. Xavier's College in Calcutta as well. I'll come to that in a bit. But at the same time, it is also very, very interesting to understand that in the, 15, in the 16th and 17th century, there is a tripartite kind of political struggle which is going on in Southern and Southwestern India, which is where Catholicism flourishes between the Mughal government, the Portuguese, coming in with their, you know, with their own imperial ambitions. And last but not least, the kind of piracy which is going on in terms of, you know, um, trade in the Indian Ocean arena and many of these communities which essentially um, convert with their entire social matrix intact 
are trying to figure out who to go to in order to find more political maneuvering room. So in some senses, this sort of conversion is very, very different from the Protestant evangelical process that is happening in Calcutta, the capital of the British you know, imperial government in the 18th and the 19th century. The syncretic practices essentially make it far easier for an accommodation of Catholicism than any kind of this kind, you know, Protestantism does not, is, has never been welcoming of syncretic practices. And that is where I think in some ways the friction starts, which is why political identity becomes much more of an important question. Then I think it happens with widespread communitarian uh, conversion practices in, in the case of, of, of the Roman Catholic project. But does that mean violence against minorities there has stopped? No. Most of the attacks starting with the 1980s, you know, mass riots, most of them have happened in southern India and, and in Orissa and other places, you know, to this long, very long lived communities of faith. And that is, that is something, you know, to I think the Hindu right wing, it really does not matter if you are a Protestant or a Roman Catholic or, you know, you're Nazarene or Syrian Christian. The very idea that you are a Christian is enough to, you know, brand an entire community as an outsider or as a traitor. And that is also something, you know, that simplification in black and white that we need to keep in mind. Thank you, Mo. The next question is from Philomena Harrison. Can either of you comment on the legacy of the past, including colonialism and empire on Christians in India today? Ooh, very wide question. Um, two things that I should mention, of course, as I keep, you know, kept on saying in the first part of my lecture, the numbers of converts in India never, at least in British India, never ever go beyond more than 1.5%. That holds stable, stable between 1850 and 1920. That holds stable now. The Christian population in India is more or less at, you know, 2.3%, about 27, 28 million, you know, um, million people. It never ever goes past that. So may, there are many kinds of associated, you know, uh, cynical readings, if you will, of Christianity, one of which, of course, is attributed to the Muslim minority communities as well, which is of demographic destabilization. That was never ever a case. That was not even on the horizon as a threat to the large demographics of Hindus and Muslims in India in the 19th century. That's one. The second part of this is a more interesting thing, and it comes with the pedagogical angle. If you ask any Indian who can, you know, who can speak in English, where they got their education from, 80% of them will tell you they went to a missionary-run institution and they read the Bible and they know the Lord's Prayer by heart and you know they celebrate Christmas with as much gusto as is possible without in any way converting at all. One of my colleagues calls this a secular conversion. I'm not very sure that I want to call it that. But that outsized impact in the creation of a particular kind of secular understanding of different kinds of religiosity essentially is the gift of Christianity in India. And that is something that we really cannot discount and should not discount. Thank you, Mo. The next question is from Mizan Rahman. Excellent presentation, Mo. I wonder if you could elaborate a little on the spiritual anxiety of the educated, converted individuals in Bengal. I'm asking that because the spirituality of an educated person like Gyanendra Mohan came with a high sense of enlightenment, individualism, and progress that should have met the loss he might have felt for leaving his previous religious community. I would also be great, it would also be great to know how Ganendra Mohan dealt with the spiritual anxiety he had with conversion. Thank you. Looking forward to reading your book. Thank you very much, Mizan. Uh, again, it's a complicated question and I'll try and answer it as much as I can. The first conversions, the 107 conversions that I, you know, the list of which I showed you in my presentation are all high caste Hindu boys who essentially are very well educated. 
Most of them go to Hindu college, many of them go to the General Assembly's institution. In terms of the literacy you know, factor in India at that particular point of time, below 1% for males, almost non-existent for women, these are absolutely the most well-educated. Many of them also come into contact with this enlightenment ideas through certain preceptors like De Rosio in Calcutta, for example, and they inherit a tradition which is inherently rationalistic. One, you know, two of the favorite authors whose books sell out almost as soon as they enter the Indian shores are David Hume and Adam Smith. What explains this shift from this rational enlightenment, you know, pedagogy to an understanding of Christianity as a path to enlightenment? That is very, you know, that is something that I have, I have tried to understand. And there are strands of it which essentially tie that enlightenment to a Christian enlightenment. That is what Eric Stokes in his classic book, English Utilitarians uh, in India, essentially tries to show when he says that that kind of deep Protestant faith is at the very, you know, base of the kind of paternalistic utilitarian uh, reforms that are being undertaken in India. And none of these very well-educated people are actually uninformed about what it might mean to convert to Christianity. How do they make, come to terms with this loss? In the case of Ganendra Mohan, as I said, you know, as soon as this, you know, as soon as these people cross that threshold, get out of the fold, become converts, it's very difficult to find any kind of archival trace because they are being erased. In Ganendra Mohan's case, that pamphlet that I talked about, which he essentially dedicates to the native Christians of India, we have some sort of understanding of how he thinks about himself. And again, when he calls himself a Brahmin Christian, he is allocating to himself a particular kind of spiritual authority, which he is trying to portray as doubly beneficial because he is straddling those two worlds of Hindu religiosity and Christian enlightenment and thereby is better placed to show to the people of India that it's converted Christians who in some ways bridge the gap between the ruler and the ruled. That is what he is trying to do. That is where his consolation lies. Is this actually true? Not really, no. Because I, again, as we find that, you know, among other people, Ganendra Mohan's classmate, Michael Mohushudan Dotto, another very, very well-known Indian converted Christian, one of you know, the best poets to come out of India in the 19th century, li lives a life of absolute penury and, and, and dies in poverty because again, none of these promises which these educated Christians think are going to be fulfilled when they, once they cross that Rubicon. None of the ideas of racial equality which they think will immediately come to them once they become Christians are actually happening. They essentially have no space either within that community that they left or that the community that they aspirationally want to belong to. So what you find in, in you know, Michael Madhushadon Dotto is the Meghnath Vodkabo, where essentially, you know, the villain figure is the one that is lionized, Rab you know, Rab Ravana is lionized. Whereas, you know, in, in, in people like Gyanandra Mohan, for all his efforts, that is the one copy of that pamphlet that I have ever found anywhere in any part of the world. And if the British Library did not exist, Canada Moon's story probably could not have been told. So essentially, there are anxieties, and those are borne out in repeated series of losses. The loss of, you know, if you go to the Bishop's, Bishop's, um, the, the Bishop's College, which is now the Shippur Engineering College, if you go look at the graves, these two people who are married for less than eight years lose about five children in the span of those eight years. This marriage lasts, you know, Komala Banerjee and Ganendra Mohan lasts eight years because she herself is dying of tuberculosis. And out of all of the children, only one, of, you know, survives her father and then her grave is, can, you know, grave cannot be found. Her mother's grave cannot also be found. Her father's grave, I have no way of tracing. I have not found a photograph or a painting of Ganendra Mohan anywhere. What does this essentially tell us? It tells us that in particular ways, identity formation happens in India, which erases out any sort of you know, difference that might crop up as a result of religious sensibilities. And that in a way narrows the space of the discourse of nationalism itself as well. So if all of us start writing only about middle class, aspirationally upper middle class and elite Bengali men and Hindu Bengali men, that means we are talking about a very partial, you know, Indian nationalism as well. 
which has done immense damage to our understanding of India in the present day. Thank you, Mo. I think we have uh, time for just one question. Uh, we are running mm -hmm. out of time. So I'll take the question by, um, from Mil Melanie John Johnson. Dr. Mo Banerjee, what is, current, what is the current situation with Christianity, inheritance, conversion in India? Is conversion allowed? Are converts accepted in 21st century India or they are forced to reconvert to Hinduism? Are these people inherited in current political climate? The very simple answer to that question is yes. What happens immediately after independence is a number of Hindu, number of, sorry, number of Indian states, which used to be Hindu princely kingdoms, for example, including a number of Western Indian states, uh, like Rajasthan, like Madhya Pradesh, and the Eastern Indian state of Orissa, essentially pass freedom of religion acts, which essentially are a way to stop conversion. Freedom of religion in this case does not mean the freedom of religion to preach one's own faith, which is enshrined in the Indian, Indian constitution, but rather the freedom to have a particular kind of Hindu identity prioritized in the states and have that you know, be the same as it was in the, prince, in the era of princely kingdoms and of princely rulers. What are the, what are the penalties that these, that these kinds of freedom of religion you know, acts impose upon the people? Well, for a very long time, it was about, you know, about 750 rupees and about, you know, one year's imprisonment. But what this did, even though in material, material terms, the, in, those are very light, light terms, what this did was give an immense amount of power to the bureaucracy and to the, to the, to, to the police, for example, or the army to intimidate converted Christians to stop them from carrying out you know, uh, rituals and traditions of their own faith. It stopped missionaries from setting up schools. And now in the present day, it has led to a number of riots, even when there are no elite conversions, only tribal conversions. We know that the RSS or the Rashtra Swam Sevak Sang has this huge gharvapasi or coming back into the poll programs, which again in the, emerged in the, in the 19th century with, with Swami Dayan and then others. And essentially, there is this vitiated atmosphere where that particular, you know, narrative of, narrative of cynicism and suspicion essentially talks about Christianity as something that is not organic, something that can be thrown off at any, any moment of time. Um, we all know, I don't know if all of us know, but it's certainly something that is very important to me. We are coming upon the 20th, uh, 20th anniversary of the, of the brutal burning of the missionary Graham Staines and his two young sons uh, by a member of the Bajrang Dal of Train Jafit associated with RSS in Orissa. In, in the last 10 years, we have had the Kandamal riots, we have had the gang, you know, gang rape of a nun, and only three or four days ago, uh, four nuns were actually, you know, without a warrant, taken and arrested by the Indian police to make sure that they were not illegally converting people anywhere. So are these people the disinherited? Yes, they are disinherited in terms of access to education. They are disinherited in terms of access to actually you know, publicly proclaiming their own identities. They are disinherited that in that at any moment, at any, you know, in, in any, any legal you know, uh, judicial or, or executive you know, uh, relief that they might claim will not be, not be taken seriously by the current dispensation. dispensation. And what this has done again, as I keep on saying, I think, like, like, you know, is, is this essentially taken out every sort of diversity which might have enriched Indian culture. And we are beginning to see a kind of homogenization which, which is not Indian in any, any sense or form. Thank you. Thank you uh, to both Mo Banerjee and Devjani Bhattacharya for that fascinating session. A uh, lot of food for thought there and I'm, eagerly looking forward to both your monographs. Um, and thank you to the audience uh, for joining us tonight. Um, our next talk uh, will be by Dr. Davesh Soneji next month on the 19th. And uh, he will be speaking on occluded Muslim histories of modern South Indian raga based music. Um, the session will be chaired by Dr. Anna Schulz from University of Chicago. So please join us. And uh, thank you, have a good evening and uh, stay well and stay safe. Thank you all.
Thank you so much. This was such an excellent presentation. Thank you.